your future is probably going to be powered by vanadium. Could you live in a dumpster? And Chase Nunes drops by to talk about broadcasting and gaming. Padre's Corner is next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Padre's Corner is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Padre's Corner is brought to you by the Books. Beautiful, affordable flowers grown on an active volcano and shipped for free. For 15% off your first bouquet, visit thebooks.com slash twit and use the code twit at checkout. That's T H E B O U Q S dot com slash twit and use the code twit to save 15%. This is Padre's Corner, Episode 7, recorded September 23rd, 2014. Jammin' with Chase Nunes. Welcome to Padre's Corner. I'm Father Robert Ballas here, the digital Jesuit. Padre's Corner is the Twitch show where we just get to play around with the stories. Pretty much anything that may have skipped through the cracks of the week's news, we get to talk about here. Things that are important to geeks and gals and the people who just like tech, science, and Anything else that might fall on a geek's plate. Now, a while back, Lisa and Leo got together and they, they said, you know, we'd like to have a show, some place, some forum where geeks can express the things that are important to them. That's what we're going to do for the next hour. Put you into the brain of a techno geeky Catholic priest and see if you come out sane on the other side. Now, speaking of sanity, let's start with a little bit of this. Your next battery might have a mineral that sounds a little bit like an X-Man thing. That's right. It's called vanadium. Now, vanadium has long been used as a alloy additive because it makes steel exceptionally strong. Now, creating an alloy with vanadium with as little as 0.15% makes a steel assembly 30% lighter with the same strength. It also retains its strength at higher temperatures than steel, so it's used as an industrial tool, as an engine part additive, as anything else that generates a load of heat to, to, to make it strong as it's undergoing that stress. Now, as it turns out, by some quirk of chemistry and physics, vanadium's not just good at making stronger knives that can ginsu a can and making engine parts that don't blow up at high RPMs. It's also fantastically efficient as a battery additive. Now, you might be asking yourself, what, what, are, you, what are you talking about, Padre? I mean, how could adding some sort of weird strengthening alloy metal to a battery increase the efficiency? Well, it comes from vanadium's ability to give and take electrons. Now, it's, it's a good material to use in batteries because it's always ready to give and take these electrons. As, as this video shows you, if, if you've got a tank of solution in which vanadium metal is dissolved, it, uh, it allows you to create a new type of battery. Electrolyte, which is sulfuric acid, is pumped past two electrodes in two different tanks that are separated by a membrane. Now, in the first tank, vanadium releases its electrons, turning the solution from blue to yellow. And in the second tank, the vanadium receives electrons, turning from green to violet. That means that the electrons travel around in a circuit, and any, at any time you have electrons traveling around in a circuit, you're going to get power. Now, it's this unique principle of vanadium, the ease at which it can take and give electrodes, which means that the solution can be reused over and over again. And it also makes it incredibly scalable. I know you're probably asking yourself, well, why wouldn't I just use a lithium ion battery? I mean, a lithium ion has been proven. We use it in, in everything. And actually, lithium ion is a lot cheaper than vanadium because, well, vanadium's not really plentiful. The reason for that is that a lithium ion battery has a a practical limit on how big you can make it before the assembly becomes unwieldy. Lithium ion can also only be charged about one to 2,000 times before it won't recharge anymore. You all know that limitation because you've seen it in your phone, you've seen it in your laptop. You know, when it can no longer be charged past a certain percentage or when it just doesn't last as long as it used to. That's because the chemistry in the lithium ion battery breaks down and eventually it just becomes a big chunk of, well, junk. Vanadium's not like that. Vanadium can be charged at least 20,000 times before you start noticing a noticeable degradation in the chemistry. That means that it can recharge a lot more, which means it's great 
industrial applications. Beyond that, it scales well to city applications because unlike a lithium ion battery, all you need to do to have a larger vanadium battery is add more electrolyte. That's right, use bigger electrodes, have a bigger tank of solution that circulates, and suddenly you go from powering a laptop to powering a city block. Uh, it's going to be a long, long time before we figure out exactly how we're going to use vanadium properly. And again, it is kind of expensive. Yes, it's going to be used mostly for industrial applications, but maybe in the future your power will come from a metal that uh, could be used to coat the bones of a reluctant warrior, turning him into a superhero. That's enough freaking science. Let's move on to some freaking engineering. This is a personal favorite of mine. If you've listened to any conspiracy theories about the moon landings, then you've probably heard the one that goes something like this. The moon landings were impossible because when you look at the lighting of the people who landed on the moon, if you, when you look at how they actually looked, you can't get that look. You can't, you can't seem as if the people on the moon seem because the lighting is all wrong. Uh, essentially, they're looking at this photo. This is the photo of Buzz Aldrin coming down the ladder and being shot by Neil Armstrong. They look at this and they say, wait a minute. If he's in the shadow of the lander, and if the moon has no atmosphere to speak of, and therefore doesn't have particles on which the light can refract, then why is he illuminated? Why isn't he completely in the dark? Why? Well, the why is because you're in a studio. It's because that we have, uh, we've, we faked the moon landing and there must be some sort of studio light that's providing light onto his, his space suit. Oh, believe, believe it or not, this is actually an astute observation. I don't want to make fun of conspiracy theorists. This is, this is something you should consider. We know that in space, without, in, a, in a near vacuum, light will travel in a straight line. It doesn't bounce off of anything like particles in the atmosphere. So where is that light coming from? Well, we, we have had explanations from rocket-headed scientists who talk about refraction off the surface of the moon and, and various other objects that might be at the right angle to, to push light back at the subject. But until now, an actual explanation has been something that we have to trust people on, not something that we could see for ourselves. Well, turns out that's all changed now, thanks to a video game engine. That's right, NVIDIA just released their brand new 980 and 970 GTX parts, and what they were able to do is include in this physics engine a, a new feature, the ability to do what is called global lighting. Until recently, all video games have been limited to point lighting. In other words, you had to put a light source in, inside of the model where you think a reflection might be coming from. The reason for that is, is simple. It's too complicated to have a global light source, something like the sun, which then has light bouncing off of it onto individual subjects that may be inside your model. Well, with the new cards, they've now got the horsepower and the physics model to, fit, to, to figure that out. They can now put an object, along with a texture that describes its reflectivity, into the middle of the model, and the model will figure out exactly where the light should bounce. So rather than having to fake the lighting, you can now say there's a sun, or there's a big light, or there's a spotlight, and the physics engine will figure it out. What they did to show off the power of this is they calculated the moon landing hoax. They tried to figure out why does this picture exist. If you look really closely, where is this light coming from? And in fact, this is not the actual moon landing. This is their recreation of what it will look like. A fascinating story behind this. When they started playing around with the variables, they realized that they couldn't get enough light bouncing off of the surface, off the various objects on the surface of the moon, to give them the right photo, the, the right match to what they saw in the actual NASA pic. So what they did was they considered what else might be in the frame. And it wasn't the surface, it was Neil Armstrong himself. You see, Neil Armstrong was wearing a spacesuit that actually reflected 85% of the light that fell upon it. And when they put that large of a model behind the camera, they found out was it matched perfectly to the picture that NASA was giving us. Now, uh, this is not going to convince most skeptics. There's still going to people, be people out there who say that the moon landing was a hoax, and, and that's just fine. But remember that the next time you're playing the next generation gaming system, it's one small frag for a first-person shooter, one giant debunking for space kind. Now, when we come back, believe it or not, I... I don't feel a rant coming on. This is not a rant week. Instead, I want to drop some knowledge on you. I want to talk about something that 
I hold near and dear, and that's about sustainability. How do we live on this planet Earth? How do we go about doing our daily thing without ripping the planet apart? But before that, let's talk about something else that I find particularly important, and that's about, well, stuff that's not tech. Now, you, me, everyone who's watching, the geeks and the gals, we love tech. We love all the shiny, blinky things. It's just our thing. You know, it, it gives us a little bit of excitement. But sometimes we forget that not everyone wants tech as a gift. Sometimes we forget that the thing that we should get for a loved one, for someone that we respect, for someone that we want to take care of, needs to be something more personable than the next phone or the next computer or the next blinky, blinky, whatever it might be. Sometimes you need to get yourself some flowers. I know this might be a shock for most of us. After all, you know, we're mostly techies. But tech isn't always the best gift for the important people in our lives. Sometimes you want something softer, more beautiful, more personal than the next shiny thing. Sometimes you need flowers. Uh, if you've ever ordered flowers online, chances are you've been burned by hidden shipping charges, upsells, and worst of all, flowers that look just a step off from colorless weeds. My favorites are the services that want me to know how to assemble the perfect bouquet. I mean, I'm a techie and a geek. And though I want to send flowers, I need someone else to help me turn a bunch of flowers into an artful bouquet. That's where the books comes in. They want to simplify the way that you order flowers online. That's T-H-E-B-O-U-Q-S dot com. Now, the books offers roses, lilies, daisies, and more, all in beautiful, dazzling, colorful, creative arrangements. The book sends flowers straight from their sustainable, eco-friendly farms located on the side of an active volcano in South America. Seriously, these are volcano flowers straight out of Dr. Evil's lair. You're probably asking yourself, why in the world would you want volcano flowers? Well, a volcano is about 10,000 feet above sea level, which means it gets more sun, and more sun means more color. And these volcano flowers are fed by pure volcanic snowmelt and minimal mineral-rich soil. All of this means that their flowers are more vibrant, more beautiful, more colorful, and more unique than anything you've ever seen. The books covers your flower, cu cut your flowers on the day that you, uh, <clears throat> three, two, one. The books cuts your flowers on the day that you order them, and they're shipped straight from the farm, so you get the freshest bouquet possible. And all orders are backed by their happiness guarantee. And my favorite part is that you can sign up for their concierge service. That means that you can arrange for them to automatically deliver flowers on birthdays, anniversaries, or just because. In other words, folks, these aren't just beautiful flowers. It's relationship insurance. Best of all, the pricing is up front and the checkout process is painless. Your loved ones get beautiful, unique flowers and you save cash. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to send your loved ones incredible flowers grown on an active volcano. How geeky is that? Visit thebooks.com slash twit. Books start, bouquets start at $40, and you can double the number of blooms for just $10 more. And you'll save 15% off your first bouquet by entering the code TWIT at checkout. Plus, get free shipping within the United States. That's T-H-E-B-O-U-Q-S dot com slash TWIT. And we thank the books for their support of Padres Corner. Now, let's get to, uh, well, not the rant, but I'm going to call it the Padres happy-go-lucky fun time story. Now, normally this is the time in Padres Corner when I, I rant out a little bit. I talk about all the things that bother me. I talk about all the things that I find disturbing. We're not going to do that this week. This week, we're going to talk a little something, something about sustainability. Now, what is sustainability? Uh, let's, let's back off because that's a big question. And instead, let's talk about our own personal habits. When we start looking at what we do, I think most of us are going to say that we like to buy. We like to buy an awful lot. Now, the reason why we like to buy, there's, there's a lot of different reasons, but ultimately it's because buying gives us that little bit of a rush, something new, something shiny, something cool, something fascinating. But over time, that wears out, and then we need to buy the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing. And most of us have closets full, nay, rooms full, the houses full of gadgets and gizmos that we're just not using anymore. Well, that's not real sustainable, but I think the bigger problem are the houses that we decide that we need. Most of us live in houses that are probably way bigger than we actually need. Oh, we don't think like that. We, we think that they're crowded. We think that we're, we're sort of closed into a small space. But when you start looking at some of the trends with small houses, small apartments throughout the world, 
I, I think you'll agree that most of us live in a space that's too dang big. And it's all because we think we need a bigger house, bigger cars, more stuff, better stuff. Oh, it is a vicious cycle, but the question is, how do we break that cycle? How do we go from wanting a bigger house to fit more stuff so we can be more productive, so we can work harder, so we can work, earn more cash, so we can buy a bigger house, so we can buy more stuff, so that we can be more productive, so we can earn more money? How do we step out of that cycle? Well, in a step, it might be by moving into a tiny house. Now, this has been something that has been de rigueur over the last 10 years, the idea of micro-apartments and tiny houses. These are just places that are much smaller than the regular 2,500 square feet or 3,000 square feet or 6,000 square feet houses that we've become so used to, the rewards for a life well lived. Now, in the last few years, we have seen the rise of these micro-apartments that are, you know, 15 by 15. They use a lot of light and negative space along with innovative space-saving technologies to make the place feel big, even though they really are small. And they can look elegant. They're, they're more out of the box than in a prison cell. And, and for those people for who a micro-apartment is still too big, there are these things. These are tiny houses, pictures of these that have been propping up, coming up all over the world. These are, well... Tiny. Typically, they, they skirt the 100 square foot limit that would require a building permit. And uh, they, even though they look like clubhouses, even though they like, look incredibly small, some people have figured out that this is all they need. Now, there, there are a lot of different reasons for moving into a micro apartment or a tiny house. Some people believe in simplifying their lives. Others like the idea of living in a manner that requires you to ask for things that you don't have in your small home. In other words, reaching out to your neighbors. Some, some others are, well, yeah, they're pure hippies and they believe that this is the way they're going to get back to nature. But some, like one of my former Jesuit brothers, just like this idea of not having a huge mortgage, not having a huge set of monthly bills that you have to pay, of not really being tied down to one place. He, he works, a, works well. He works a, a professional job. He gets paid. But then he likes to use his excess cash to travel around the world. He thinks of himself as a citizen of the world, a, a beneficiary of the kindness of strangers from all the countries that he visits. Well, no matter how you come to a tiny house or to a micro apartment, both of them are essentially about the same idea of making do with less or sustainability. Now, but what if, what if a tiny house, what if a micro apartment, what if one of those really small places was still too big for you? What if you looked at that and you said, oh, that looks interesting, but, uh, well, I, you know, I don't really need a house at all. I just need some place to sleep. I need some place to put my clothes. I need some place to park my butt when I'm tired. Well, if that's the case, you probably need to talk to sustainability guru, Professor Jeff Wilson. He's the dean of Houston Tillotson University College in Austin, Texas. He holds a PhD in environmental sciences from the University of Canterbury. He's a respected associate professor of biological sciences, and he's the recipient of one of the most competitive teaching honors in the United States, the Regents Outstanding Award. He has received funding from the National Science Foundation, from Ford Motor Company, and Home Depot, and he is on the forefront of research into curriculum and sustainability. And he's got one message for you. And that is, maybe you don't need a house. Maybe what you need is a dumpster. <laughs> That's right. Professor Wilson used to live in a 2,500 square foot house. He now lives in a converted dumpster that has, get this, 33 square feet of space. Now, he moved into the dumpster as a test of his convictions about sustainable living. It's part of his project dumpster. He wanted to build a low impact, zero net waste dwelling that would have as little impact on the planet as possible. Now here's, here's a rundown of what he has in his dumpster. He has 33 square feet of living space. He has a bed. He has four pairs of pants. He has four shirts. He has three pairs of shoes, three hats, nine bow ties, all stored in a false floor with some cooking equipment designed for camping. Here's what he doesn't have. He doesn't have a shower, a sink, or a toilet. He doesn't have a washer or a dryer. He doesn't have a closet. He doesn't have a desk. He doesn't have running water. He doesn't have insulation. Now, recently, he upgraded the dumpster so that now he has a sliding roof so that it doesn't rain on him. And they added an air conditioner because the temperature used to get to 130 degrees without one. And in the future, he hopes to add solar panels, a sleeping loft, a rainwater collection system, solar shower, and a garden. 
here's the big thing. Over the last three months, and this is a project in which he's been living in this thing for many, many months, he has been able to pare down his life to the bare essentials. He's been able to ask himself the questions, well, what do I need to live? What's the bare minimum? What are the things that are absolutely essential to my life? And, and here's the big one. What are the things that I can count on the community to provide? All of those questions have been things that he has struggled with with Project Dumpster, and it's been a fascinating experiment in sustainability. Imagine if people were able to get rid of all the junk that they have. Imagine if they were able to, to just strip away all the things that we've accumulated over the years, all the things that we think we need, all the things that we think we need to prove that we've made it. Well, in a word, that's Project Dumpster. That's us looking very intelligently at what we need for sustainability and making the smallest footprint on the earth as possible. Now, I'm, I'm not a hippie. And I'm not one of these people who's going to say, well, we should all live in a dumpster or even that we should all live in a tiny house or even that we should all live in a micro apartment. I think everyone needs to make a choice on their own about how much space they need and how much of an impact on Earth that they're going to have. Uh, personally, in my life, I, I have sort of a built in countdown timer. Every time I move, I have to consider what comes with me. And since I'm moving every two to six years, it means that every half decade, I'm clearing out all the clutter and it doesn't make it, it doesn't make the trip with me to my next house. But I think most of us, most of us could have a serious conversation about what we need. With us being so mobile, with our generation being so connected, with us being citizens of the world, with us not wanting to use the benchmarks of past generations as to how big our cars are and how big our houses are, maybe most of us could have a higher quality of life if we all lived in a smaller house. Well, when we come back, I'm bringing in Chase Noons from Geek Gamer TV. We're going to chew the fat about all things gaming, about all things tech, and about all things Minecraft. But before that, why don't we take a little bit of time to talk about the tech? <laughs> A few weeks ago, I got a chance to take a look at, um, well, a bean bag. That's right. Uh, many of you are saying, well, what, what, why would a bean bag be on a tech show? It's actually designed for this kind of a generation. It's designed for the techies. It's designed for the gamers. It's designed for the geek who wants something that is both incredibly nerdy and crazy comfortable. Check it out. It's the Sumo Lounge Omni Reloaded. I've been reviewing Sumo Lounge gear for nearly six years. Over that time, I've come to know the line as pricey, but super high quality units that changed my idea of what geek furniture can look like. The comically large Sumo Titan introduced me to a bed-sized apparatus that could double as a crash bag. The ridiculously comfortable Sumo Sway Couple was the first beanbag to replace my beloved Lazy Boy Lounger. And of course, it all started with my review of the Sumo Omni, an ultra-rugged throwable beanbag with more sitting styles than a clothing-optional co-ed hot yoga class. Ew. By the way, Filipino pro tip, if you want your new sumo to stay new for longer, keep it in the plastic shipping bag for as long as possible. But enough with the trip down memory lane. We're here to talk about the new hotness in Uber Geek lifestyle accessories, the Sumo Lounge Omni Reloaded. Part beanbag, part lounger, part lawn chair, the Reloaded is a combination of the original Sumo Omni and the semi-rigid support design of the Sumo Sway. Sumo designed the Reloaded to be an on-the-go or in-the-den piece of furniture that could combine durability, comfort, and a unique style, all in a single unit, complete with nylon carrying bag. I ended up using my review unit on the roof of my house to get real sun on my skin, which is accustomed to only feeling the monitor backlight. Of course, just like that hot yoga class, Sometimes, clothing optional is the way to go. The Reloaded is essentially a padded frame that is 75 inches long, 27 inches wide, and 5 inches thick. It's made of double-stitched, ripstop nylon covering a heaping helping of dense foam over a steel frame. The Reloaded has three independent ratcheted swivels that allow it to be formed and positioned in the sitting style of your liking. Available in five colors, including blue, orange, green, fuchsia, and nature, the Reloaded can be set up in about 30 seconds without tools and without instructions. 
Unless, of course, you're a member of the Twit editing staff and you find angles absolutely baffling. The ability to fold and hide away brings comparisons to folding chairs and lawn loungers. But the comfort and utility of the Reloaded is unmatched, even by high-end temporary furniture. The padding is just right. The ratcheted swivels let you position the Reloaded exactly at your comfort spot, and the ease of deployment makes it ideal for the beach, the dorm, the living room, the backyard, the cookout or tailgate, your man cave, video game playing, or whatever the heck this is. The Sumo Omni Reloaded is available now for $219. Shipped for free anywhere in the continental United States. I had a lot of fun uh, reviewing that. Uh, I, I've been reviewing Sumo Lounge stuff for a long, long time. And it, it's funny because the first time I uh, I got shipped one of their products, it just showed up at my door. They said, well, we've got a beanbag. And I was thinking, beanbag? Beanbags are stupid. I mean, beanbags explode. They make a big mess. But I've actually had a lot of fun. It's, it's sort of been the primary uh, source of furniture for most of my man caves. Now, speaking of man caves, there's a guy here who has his own man cave. It's a tech man cave, and you may know him. He's uh, Chase Noons from Geek Gamer TV. Chase, it is so good to have you back on the show. Thank you for coming on Padres Corner. Hey, Padre. It's great to be back once again and now officially on Twitter. So congratulations, by the way. I know. It's, it's kind of weird, right? Yeah, it's and now I'm on 007, episode 7, so I feel like a mystery guy right now. So. Uh, oh, yes, great, as long as you don't start shooting people, it's all good. Right. Now, now uh, the, let's let's talk a little bit about where I found you. I mean, I, I think the first time I ever met you was was through the Twitch stream. I, I, I can't remember. It might have been NSFW. We, you were watching, I was watching, and we were chatting in the chat room. I'm like, hey, oh, wow, someone else who makes vi uh, video content. Uh, and then I found you on the Twitters. And on the Twitters, you're known as Noons. Uh, where people can find all your wonderful exploits, including, you know, supporting the Seattle Seahawks, which, I mean, I mean seriously, I mean. How can you not support a Super Bowl champion, right? I mean, come yeah, on. That's, that's why I support the Niners. Because, <laughs> you know. They well, well the granted, if you were, you know, following them during the 80s. Oh. Okay. Oh. It's all right. Oh, wow. All right. You know what? Actually, I, I can't say anything because this year we're just going to be horrible. I mean, uh, uh, I was sitting down with a couple of other 49er fans, and uh, we were just kind of reminiscing about the old days, saying how we lost so much talent in the offseason. It's just, it's not going to be pretty. But you have a beautiful stadium, though. State-of-the-art technological awesomeness. So I'll give you that. State-of-the-art awesomeness, but they did this really weird thing. If you go to Levi Stadium, you'll notice the concourse is way smaller than it should be. When you consider how many people are going to be going there to, to buy things, there's just not enough space for you know people throughout the stadium. It's just going to be congested. And then we realized they designed it that way. What they wanted was they wanted you to order food from your yeah. seat because then they get an extra fee for bringing it to you. Uh, I don't know if I like that. Not a big fan. Well, only if it works, though. I mean, I, I was reading reports that some people waited nearly 20 to 30 minutes for drinks and food, so... Obviously, that needs to be tightened up a little bit. But no, it seems really cool to be able to access certain things from your seat and have it actually work and the Wi-Fi and all that. That's pretty neat. Yeah. Well, let's stop talking about uh, football because that's not what we're here for. We're yeah. a bunch of geeks, so <laughs> we're going to talk about a bunch of geeky stuff, even though tech, the stadium is it's a huge geek thing. Oh, yeah. I, I want to talk a little bit about you. Can, can you tell me something about you? I mean, I've seen you on your stream. I've, I've seen you do your, your content. You're very dedicated. You, you've, you've been, like, doing it forever. And even even yeah. when the gains haven't been visible, you've decided to stick with it. And I, I have nothing but admiration for that. But where did you start? I mean, where did you get this idea that you wanted to broadcast? Well, it, it does start when I was a kid. Uh, I grew up on a farm just outside of Petaluma, a small little town of Sonoma. And, uh, you know, I, I never was really involved with technology. My thing was taking care of cows. And, you know, herding them in, milking the cows, literally feeding them and then heading off to school and then repeating it when you get home. And one thing that I used to always do when I was a kid was I took a, I had a tape recorder and I would record like I'm doing San Francisco Giants baseball games on the radio. And I would record it and then I would be with my friends and we would record commercials. I still wish I had those tapes today, but we would basically just mock being on the radio. And I knew it was always something that I wanted to get involved with, but I just obviously couldn't get, you know, I'm a kid. I couldn't get involved with it at the time. I lived out in the middle of nowhere, had no internet, no no computer other than like a Tandy thing that you plug into your TV. Uh, it wasn't until basically, you know, early 2000s and 
uh, late 2000s, you know, through going, uh, growing up and, and, and watching cable, um, I got, you know, like a lot of us out there, loved watching Leo on uh, ZDTV and tech TV and that sort of thing. And so in the year, in the 2000s, I, I, I got involved with, you know, buying a microphone, a USB headset, and I figured out, well, hey, now I can do that radio thing when I was a kid. But instead of doing that, now I can do it on technology and gaming and things that I really love and enjoy. So in 2005, a friend of mine out of the Portland, uh, Oregon area, his name's Kyle. He said, hey, let's do a show. We'll call it Hoser Chat. He lived up near the Canadian border. I lived in Florida at the time. I lived there for about a year. And we started doing some podcasts in 2005. And that eventually evolved into uh, Geek Gamer TV, which is really uh, my self-indulgence of being able to talk about gaming and tech with friends and, and, and great key figures, you know, interviews and that sort of thing. And it's one of those things that I can't let go, even though, yeah, I work a normal full-time nine to five job. Uh, but it's one of those things that it's, it's, it's in my blood. It's, it's ingrained in me and uh, wouldn't exchange it for anything else. You know, Sida Fry is in the chat room is saying how he started listening to Leo on a, a ZDTV and then on Tech TV. And it's funny because I think there's a there's a huge generation of us that had that exact experience that we saw on yeah. Tech TV. Uh, and, you know, before that, tech was sort of a hobby. I, I yeah. grew up in the 80s and it was something I did for my business, but people didn't want to know how the tech worked. They just wanted to make sure that it worked. You came in right. and you did your contract, whatever. Yeah. Tech, watching tech TV for the first time, in fact, actually getting cable for the first time so I could watch tech TV, it yeah. was this experience of, whoa, there's people like me who think that this stuff's going to be really, really important. Uh, and, and for me, Leo was that voice. In, in fact, I had, I had Becky Worley on, uh, on Padre's Corner last week, and, and she talked about how the implosion of tech TV, uh, because essentially it came 10 years too early. Uh, yeah. Comcast didn't know what to do with it. They, they killed it in its crib. But the implosion and then the explosion of all that talent all around the industry has has created what we have right now. A lot of people don't realize so much of the talent that you know for their tech work were either came straight from tech TV or worked with Leo or were inspired by Leo. I, I, that's, you know, I think that's one of those things that just connects all us tech broadcasters. We, we want to do what we saw. And it's, it's one of those things when you're, when you're able to talk about your passions and, and talk about something that you truly enjoy. Like, for example, this, uh, this you know, past couple months, we were, we were at PAX Prime 2014 and we're, we're doing interviews with all these independent developers. And uh, then I'm bringing it home and cutting up the video and posting it up on the, on the website and everything. And I'm just thinking, you know, yes, I'm not making anything on this, but gosh darn it, I love doing this. Uh, this, this is fun. This is, this is one of those things where, you know, when I was a kid, like I said, you know, I, I acted like, you know, I was on the radio and, and, and creating my own content. I wasn't able to publish it anywhere, but now I'm able to show off my skills and, and maybe perhaps do it someday for like, maybe like Twit, for example, or, or, or a company, you know, where I can help them grow. I, it's one of those things where, you know, for me, it's, it's all about, uh, being on the forefront of that technology. And when you're involved in broadcasting like this, you get to learn so many things, you know, about lighting and camera techniques and editing. And you learn all these tools of the trade that are very applicable to a lot of different skills that you do. And uh, what better way to do it than doing it something, doing it on something that you love. And uh, that's, you know, I'm, I wouldn't exchange it for anything else in the world. Uh, even though a couple of weeks ago, I had a huge website crash. <laughs> I lost a lot of data, but thanks to some awesome members of the community, we got you know, most of it back. And it's one of those things where that was kind of like a gut check that happened to me a couple of weeks ago where I lost a lot of my content. I was able to get a lot of it back. And I realized that, and during those two weeks where I wasn't able to generate anything, I missed it dearly. So it's one of those things I just won't stop doing. All right. Right. Uh, and now uh, Chase, it, it's funny that you're talking about that because not, not too long ago, a couple of hours ago, actually, I got this, um, an email from a, a fan who was talking about how he wanted to get into podcasting. And he was, you know, he typical questions I get are, well, what kind of equipment do you use? What would you suggest? And so I, uh, I suggested a rig. I'm like USB headset or USB microphone, something like an Audio-Technica 2020 or a PR40 with a US, uh, XLR to USB adapter. Uh, right. And then he writes me back. He's like, no, 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 no. I'm like, I want to get a TriCaster. And I kind of squint my eyes. I'm like, well, okay, well, TriCaster is going to start at... Yeah. 
five thousand dollars for like the, the the low end, and he goes, no, 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 I want like the TriCaster that that Twit has. <laughs> and so I I, oh, wow. I start I'm like, okay, well, or, uh, let's let's take a look at this because yeah. we're talking about sixty to one hundred thousand dollars now. By the time you you get together all the gear that you need to drive that TriCaster, and and then he yeah. says, oh, I know, but I mean, you podcasters make so much money. I'm I'm going to make that back in the oh, first oh, month, oh, and oh. I'm thinking. Whoa, whoa, oh, <laughs> time <man>. out. <laughs> if, no. you're, if you're in this for the money, man, you are in the wrong profession. Uh, it's, I mean, unless obviously if you're, you know, uh, Adam Curry, John C. Dvorak, you know, your, your, your names that have established yourself in the history of doing things and Leo and all that. Yeah, you have this notoriety that came along with people knowing who, uh, who you are and what you do. But man, if you're starting out from scratch, uh, to, to make a profit. I mean, gosh, I, I, I don't know if I'll ever make a profit with all the money investments, but I equate it to, uh, you know, like a hobby in a way where, you, you know, some people have cars, some people have pinball machines or, or, they, or they collect fine dining in China and things like that. My thing is uh, tech equipment and broadcasting. Um, and it's one of those things where maybe it'll turn into something, but you know what? Even if it doesn't, that's not the reason why I'm involved with it. I'm involved with it because I, I enjoy the community immensely. I enjoy the technology. I enjoy talking about things that I love, gaming, tech, politics, you name it. Um, it's its one of those things that uh, you'd have to pry me away. But if someone's trying to get involved with it on a purely money-making scheme, gosh, you are getting into it for the wrong reasons. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, that's, that's one of the things that I think anyone who's been playing this game for a while knows just innately. And that is, it's got to be a labor of love. Yeah, you, yeah. You're not, I mean, again, unless you've got a huge name, uh, like let, let's say you're an actor, a famous actor who starts doing a podcast, you can't expect people to just start watching you. I, I remember uh, I, I've been broadcasting for 10 years, uh, be, even before YouTube was available. Just really yeah. bad production values, basically a couple of light bulbs and a secondhand camera. Uh, with horrible editing software. And I was lucky if one person watched it a week. Uh, but it was something I actually enjoyed doing. And, you know, I, I didn't even think, I didn't even consider the fact that you could make money from doing this if you were joined up with a big enough outfit. Uh, right. I, I think that's that's the healthier way to look at it, which is, do you like talking about what you're talking about? Because if you do, this is your hobby. And if your hobby turns into something that you can make money on, fantastic. But if not... That's 99% of the people out there. It, it's it's one of those things where, like like you said, you know, me, a lot of a lot of you guys out there on Twitter are like, who is this guy with the exception of the guys uh, and gals that are in the chat room going, hey, I know him. But the majority of you don't know me. So my, my number one thing is if you stumble across my content, my number one thing is to put out something of quality that looks good, that sounds good. Because I'm never going to have another opportunity to make a first impression with any of you. And so that's the way I see it. And I think if, if you're an aspiring, you know, broadcaster, you want to get involved with podcasting, you don't have to spend thousands and thousands of dollars worth of equipment, but just make sure that whatever you try to put out there, that you, you put your best attempt forward with what you have. When I started, I had a USB microphone. Like I said, I did a podcast with a guy that lived halfway across the country. And instead of just recording his side of the conversation on my system, he actually did a local recording on his end. He uploaded it to, uh, you know, FTP because there wasn't really any major file sharing sites at the time. And I downloaded the, the, his 700 meg audio wave file. And then I put it all together in post because to me, it was all about quality. So for by, me, by the way, that's yeah. that's how Leo did it at the very beginning. If, if, oh, really? if you're watching Leo here at Twit at the, at the wow. very beginning, when it was just this week in tech, uh, I remember he used to buy audio devices and he would send it out to his guests who were remote, and they and there would be there would be a low quality version that would be Im available immediately, and then there was a high quality version that was available later on, and that was because, you know, e even a decade ago. We didn't really have the technology to do what we do right now. Putting yeah. together a studio right now is ridiculously inexpensive. It doesn't mean that it's easy, but compared to what you used to have to do, the barrier to entry is ridiculously low. Right. And and the thing, on the same side of it, then you have a lot more newcomers into this this great realm of, of stuff. And you get a lot of people, you know, like you said, asking you, and people have asked me, you know, how to get involved and in getting into it. And I think that's where 
you know, stories need to be, you know, pushed aside and just give facts, you know, Hey, you're not going to make, you know, you know, buttload of money on this. You're, you're not going to, you're not going to be able to quit your day job immediately and go, Hey, I'm, I'm a broadcaster now. You know, I'm, I make videos on YouTube now, grant some, some can, and some are able to light that spark, but it's one of those things where you just got to go into it with the right expectations and, you know, go on that path. Uh, Chase, let's let's talk a little bit about what you what you do with your broadcasting. So now that we know sure. that you're a broadcaster, now that we know that you're a content creator, uh, you've kind of found a niche. You found the things that you you really enjoy. You you uh, you have Geek Gamer TV, which uh, by the way, I I have been following your exploits. You had that horrible horrible server crash. Where basically, yeah. it took down all your content, right? I mean, did you lose oh. everything? Uh, yeah. Uh, in a nutshell, yes. Uh, basically. About two weeks ago, just over two weeks ago, I was a, a member of the community, wanted to start working on a Wikipedia project uh, for, for Geek Gamer TV. And so he needed an FTP account uh, so he can um, make some changes to the wiki files and that sort of thing. So I went into cPanel, uh, which a lot of, you know, if you host your own website, you might be familiar with that. Went in to cPanel, uh, set up an FTP account, but I screwed up. It, it didn't point to the right folder, right directory. Uh, so there was two options. It said delete the user or delete the user and the associated files. Now I took it under the impression that it would delete anything that that user uploaded, you know, associated with that account. So what I didn't realize is it deleted everything in the HTML underscore web folder, which included media, images, files, templates, my entire life. That's one of those, um, those, those oopsie moments where you're just sort of, oh, gosh, what did I just press? Oh. I, uh, uh, one of my good friends is in the chat room. His name's Jay Huckabee. He, uh, I, I called him up right away. Uh, on, it was a Sunday, and I was like, I'm sorry to disturb you on a Sunday. Joe, Joe what, what do I need to do? Uh, what can I do? And literally him and another friend of mine, a uh, co-host on a Minecraft show I do called uh, Minecraft Me, Joe Falby, we all were on a conference call on Skype. We literally spent 10 hours that e that day and evening trying to recover. But long story short, to no avail, we just couldn't get everything back. Um, and then the next day, I, I literally had a nervous breakdown. I, I, I thought that I was going to lose everything. And it, it, it was going to be very hard for me to pull the resources back. But miraculously, I was able to pull everything back. The only thing I really had to do all over again was the actual website itself, move files back into place. So it was pretty much down for the past couple of weeks. But my number one concern was getting everything back up for the community. Uh, there were a lot of people who like watching what we're doing and they're confused, like, whoa, what happened? And there are a lot of them are kids. Uh, they just, you know, they don't get it. They don't understand, you know, that website crash and nine years of your life has gone away. And then they don't realize that, I'm also working a normal job, so it does. It's not going to come back immediately. Why can't you have the site back up today? Well, because I have Tomorrow. to go to work. I actually have to make money so I can feed my family. Yeah. And I know the number one thing everyone's going to say, well, well, why didn't you have any backups? Well, I did. That's why we were able to bring back a lot of the media, uh, but I didn't back up some of the other things, or we thought we had backups in place. Uh, and as Leo always says, you know, you got to back it up to get it back. You know, uh, <laughs> you know, everybody's got that carbonite ad stuck in your head, but it's true. Uh, but the most important thing out of this whole experience, I would say is first off, community is awesome. The, the Twit community is awesome. The Jupiter Broadcasting community, the Geek Gamer TV community, all these, all, a lot of members from all these separate communities came to me, offered their assistance. Um, and it really showed me how awesome this whole thing of broadcasting can be. And, uh, Thanks to all of them, uh, I was able to get things back together today. There's still more things that need to be done in the back end, but at least we got the website back. And uh, gosh, talk about a whole adventure that I would never want to repeat ever again. <laughs> There's a lot of people in the chat room who are saying, oh, yeah, I've had that experience. And it's the worst. The worst part is when you realize your backup wasn't doing what you thought it was doing. Exactly. Uh, because most you don't most of us don't verify our backups because we only need our, need our backup when something bad has happened. Yep. So as long as we see the data there, we're, it's fine. I, I remember I, I was working with an organization that had a, a, a website that had been storing results from an experiment that had been ongoing for 35 years, um, and uh, they had they had two on-site backups and two off-site backups, so they thought they were covered. 
right. uh, as it had turned out 10 years ago there was some sort of bad configuration change that was what was made and those tape because this was tape those tape backups were storing headers for the files oh. nothing else so they had mm. nothing but what the files should be called uh, and so when the primary system went down they 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 were able to go back to 10 years ago but they lost 10 entire years of data just wiped out and it's no no longer in existence anywhere and i think that's that's actually something that many of us have to deal with oh yeah and it, and it's one of those things where yeah you're right you want to verify your backups we thought we had a system in place uh obviously we didn't or we had a kind of a piecemeal system in place once the site is really at 100% uh, we're going to be implementing probably more backup solutions than you typically probably need. Uh, but it's one of those things where uh, I, I think everybody, you know, even if it's your photos on your computer or something on your phone, you know, you can't just put all your trust into one cloud-based service or whatever the case may be, whatever you use, Carbonite, CrashPlan, you name it, whatever. Uh, it's one of those things where you need to make sure that those backups are there and then set a routine, you know, check them every other week or check them weekly, set a reminder on your phone, those kind of things. But, uh, but yeah, uh, gosh, uh, you know, we, we actually, we were desperate, you know, we sent the drives to a drive recovery company um, and they, they couldn't even try, they couldn't even recover the files and the, the damages, you know, there was no hard, you know, hardware damage to the drives, but, but yeah, long story short, just, man, just don't let it happen to you, you guys. Please don't, because it's one of those feelings I would never wish upon anybody, anybody at all. And, you know, also there's there's a little bit of that, uh, well, as an amateur broadcaster, I, I still count myself as an amateur broadcaster, there's so much stuff that you've built up just because it works. Oh, it looks right, and so you leave it, and you don't document what you did, and yeah. you don't make sure that it's going to continue to work and you don't make sure that it's being backed up properly, and then something happens, and it's almost impossible to get back to where you used to be. Uh, but let, you know, yeah. let's, yeah, we've all got our backup woes. Let's let's move yeah. on a little bit. You, you're all about gaming. Let's talk a little bit about gaming. Yes. Can we? Get, do you yes. want to get to some stories? Sure, let's do it. Let's talk a little bit about World of Warcraft. Well, specifically about what the company behind World of Warcraft, Blizzard has been doing in the past couple of years. Over the last seven years, Blizzard has been working on a new game called Titan. It's a massively multiplayer online game, sort of like World of Warcraft, which, as we all know, is, is a fantastically, ridiculously profitable hit. They have decided, after that seven years and $50 million of development, that they're going to kill the title. Uh, in the words of the CEO, it just wasn't fun. They just didn't find the passion. They didn't find the playability like they did with World of Warcraft. Uh, Chase, I got to ask you, I mean, obviously this isn't going to kill Blizzard. They're still making money no. hand over fist. People are still yeah. playing World of Warcraft. But the fact that they haven't been able to do anything besides World of Warcraft, and obviously they were trying to branch out. They were trying to get another genre of MMO. Uh, it kind of it makes me wonder... Maybe they're a one-trick pony, a very profitable trick pony, but maybe just that's their only thing. Well, I, I think seven years for a development process like that, way too long. I mean, ideas, thoughts, technologies, ideas from seven years ago definitely don't translate to today. Uh, there's been so many different advances. Obviously, we don't need to go through that. But that being said, the... To say that, you know, they're a one-trick pony, well, maybe. I mean, Hearthstone is doing really well. Uh, you know, I have one of my friends who's absolutely hooked on it right now. Uh, for me, I uh, I caught the wow bug a couple of years ago, but I pretty much just went, eh, I got other things I need to do. <laughs> but I think it's just it was just too long of a development process for them to, you know, say, all right, we're going to move on. But at you got to think of it. Seven years ago, where was World of Warcraft? And then say, where was World of Warcraft three years ago or five years ago? And then, you know, if you look at it on a chart, they're you know probably bringing in more money, hand over fist, hand over fist, hand over fist. And then probably the development lacked on that. And so, the, you know, they spent all this money, but it's just, I think it was just a time thing. They, they need to start over, wipe the slate clean and say, we need to commit to a two-year cycle on this. And if we have a good idea, let's push it out in two years. If not, you know, cut it, move on. There's Dr. Morbius and Scott Michaud in the chat room who are saying, though obviously they're pointing out that 
World of Warcraft isn't the only property that Blizzard has, but it was the first property that they were really trying to push as this is the next thing. If you loved Warcraft, you're going to love Titan. And that's why they put so much development money to it. In fact, a few of the, the people in the chat room are pointing out that that was money that they probably should have spent on World of Warcraft. There, there are issues with that game that the users have been long wanting them to fix. Uh, and yes, they have Diablo. Yes, they have StarCraft. Uh, yes, they have Hearthstone. But uh, it, it still makes me kind of wonder, was this, was this a project of folly? Uh, you know, obviously games get canceled all the time. Lou M.M. is pointing out that Duke Nukem Forever took well, forever. But Wait, that came out? Wait, what? No, I'm just <laughs> I know, right? I'm right? <laughs> well, we, well, seriously, we're both gamers. How long has, has Duke Nukem Forever been uh, just a, a running joke in the gaming community? Yeah. You could always count on saying, oh, yeah, that platform, it's going to come out when Duke Nukem Forever is released. And it was finally released, and it was just a turd. It was horrible. Right. It was, it was, and I'm thinking maybe that's what Blizzard saw with Titan. They were looking at it saying, after seven years and this much money, we can't release it. They're just gonna they're gonna deride this thing. There, it's it will actually hurt our other titles. Yeah, that's that's the number one thing, right? I mean, you work on it for so long, your your gaming public is going to get that impression, like, man, this is gonna be one of the most epic games of all time. Maybe it's gonna be even better than World of Warcraft. And then what happens? They push it out, like Duke Nukem Forever, and it's like meh. And then you have the super big danger of hurting your existing brand of World of Warcraft. So it's one of those things where maybe they decide, all right, we're going to cut cut our losses. You have $15 million, a lot of money to invest, but we still have a good solid title. Hearthstone's you know, working on strong as well. Maybe we go back to the drawing board. We'll start over from fresh or we'll just put more resources into our existing properties. I mean, they have been quoted saying that they, they don't intend on shutting down World of Warcraft in five years. They they plan on doing it forever. Uh, obviously, as long as they're making money hand over fist, of course. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Shareholders don't care what you're releasing as long as they see the, right. the bottom line. Uh, yeah, it, yeah it, it, it makes me kind of happy that I never caught the, the World of Warcraft bug. And that was actually a conscious decision on my part. I remember I got a free trial and I played it for 24 hours straight. And I thought, this is an awesome game. And then I thought... I, I need to work. I yeah. I can't. It, it was it was like the only other game I've ever known that had that kind of power over me that could make me yeah. just lose track of time was when I played uh, Civilization uh, and like the old Civilization, Civilization 2, 3, and 4. And ultimately, I had to say, I, I can't play this game. I, I just cannot start because my addictive OCD personality is going to latch onto it and I will forsake eating, bathing, and working. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, games can do that, obviously. And, you know, when you have a game like that, yeah, that will take away your life. And then that, that happened to me. Like I said, you know, a couple you know, a couple years ago, I started to get involved with it. I'm like, wait a minute. Uh, I'm not really making content now. I'm just kind of slowing that down a little bit. And and then, you know, when we do our, sh uh, we you know, we do a show called Geek Gamer Weekly where we talk weekly about gaming and tech. And one of the things we talk about is, so what have you been playing? And the running joke was just like an auto answer. It's like, oh, wow. Oh, really? <laughs> and, then, and then the other guy's like, He's playing Eve, like Eve's his addiction. You know, John is is an Eve guy. So, so yeah, no, they can take over your life, and maybe you know, maybe it took over their lives. I mean, seven years is a really long time to be developing on, on a title like this. You know, a AAA title. So, probably the best. And but I'm hoping that we we haven't seen the last out of them. It's one of those things where they they are being somewhat inventive, obviously with Hearthstone, and maybe we'll see something else. Chase, what are the big addictions right now in video gaming? Because I know World of Warcraft has always been an addiction, although yeah. it's more of an acceptable addi addiction now. Eve Online uh, yeah. gets a lot of people. StarCraft obviously gets a lot of people. Not as popular in the United States as, no. say, in Asia, all over Asia. Uh, the, um, beyond that, what are the big titles, the ones that like really are time sucks? Well, I mean, look, look, at, look at League of Legends right now. I mean, just just look at that game and how it's just blowing up the world. I mean, they had an entire, uh, basically, theater set up at PAX this year for their regional championships. Uh, you know, they they pack out auditoriums, big concert halls uh, where people are cheering and, you know, the productions are just incredible. Uh, you know, when you see games like that and, and turning video games into an esport, into a serious thing where people are actually having conversations like these guys are 
or consider them athletes and, and that sort of thing. I mean, you have games like that that are incredible. And obviously, you know, games like Counter-Strike are still strong today. If we're talking about first-person shooters, you know, uh, Call of Duty, obviously always a big, you know, annual title that's, you know, off off the rails, of course. So I, I think, you know, when you have those games, um, you know, Halo had its, you know, st I still think it's still pretty popular. I mean, last year at PAX, 2013 PAX, they had a Halo, you know, championship. Uh, at uh, one of the big halls in Seattle. So, you know, those those types of games are still very, very strong and very, very popular. And then for the sports guys, since we did talk about football earlier, Madden, right? A perennial powerhouse and a title as well that's very, very popular. That could take hours away from your life. So there's a lot of big titles out there that can still do that. Oh, by the way, uh, speaking of Halo, have you have you had a chance to play Halo 5 yet? No. Uh, I mean, oh, I mean, they don't call it Halo 5. I believe they call it um, Destiny, right? Destiny, <laughs> No, no, I, I refuse to touch it right now because my my feeling is there goes part of my life. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, I try a lot of games. So this way, you know, people can ask me, well, Chase, what do you think about this? And what do you think about that? And it's really hard to balance all that time because it takes sometimes, a, you know, a couple few hours to get involved in a title to really, you know, get immersed and, and know what you're talking about. I'm not a guy that can play something for five, 10 minutes and go, yeah, that's good. Or, yeah, that sucks. Uh, you know, I'm I'm not that kind of reviewer. Um, you know, I like to get involved with it, but no, I I'm I I've been holding back from trying to touch it for right now. Uh, Chase, what do you think about this? Uh, I, again, this is just my own personal experience, yeah. but I can pick up a shooter. I can pick up Halo. I can pick up Destiny. I can play COD. I can play TF2, and I play a good eight hours. You know, on a weekend. Yeah. But then I'll put it down and I won't touch it again for a couple of months. And I don't feel like the jonesing to play it for a couple of months. Personally, I find MMOs much more able to suck me in. Like when I start mm. playing an MMO, I can't stop. I want to keep developing my character. And I'm always yep. wondering what's happening to that character if I'm not there. And, you know, I'm not <laughs> leveling as fast as everyone else is playing. It, yeah. That's what they were designed for, right? I mean, MMOs are like first person shooters but with a penalty for not continuing to play. Well, e even first first version shooters, I remember, gosh, it might have been Call of Duty uh, 3 or 4 when they first started introducing prestige levels. So so you would play online and you would build your ranks. Um, it might have been Call of Duty Modern Warfare, but you would eventually get up to this maximum rank and then you would reset, right? And then you would have the prestige level. I remember Paul Throt talking about this a couple of years ago on, on Windows Weekly. And it's like, then you get addicted to get to the next prestige level and the next one and the next one. Um, when Star Trek Online first came out and, you know, I'm a big Star Trek fan. I jumped on that and I, you can ask my wife, I play like every single night because I wanted to get ranked up, you know, to captain or admiral because uh, everybody was trying to get to that point, right? So you could have a bigger ship and more, you know, more options and characters. So I I agree with you on MMOs that they would suck you in, but I don't think it's just an MMO thing. It, it could be a first-person shooter thing, especially if you're an online player. You want to build those ranks when people go, oh, oh, there's Sir Chaos. Oh, wow, he's prestige level. Wow, you know, that sort of thing. So yeah, it's a little bit of, uh, yeah, addiction for sure. <laughs> I'm more of the guy who will play Titanfall and get killed five times in two minutes, and I'm fine. I'm, after that, I'm like, okay, yeah. cool. I got killed a lot. I blew up a few things. I'm fine. Yeah, as long as you're playing with your friends, and that's or or playing with people that you communicate with. I think that's the best thing about online gaming is you know I've met so many awesome people through, uh, you know, gaming and online. But I'm also an old old school online gamer where uh, I would actually you know, take my beige box down to a part birthday party room and play Doom, uh, you know, on a network. And we, you know, LAN parties and that sort of thing. And I still do LAN parties to this day. Uh, make many trips down to, to Portland, Oregon. PDX LAN is down there. And I'm down there just gaming up with my friends. And that's through the LAN that I was able to start the whole broadcasting thing because I met, you know, have a friend in that arena. And I was like, well, let's do a show. So, yeah, I mean, it's all about the online gaming, too, and the community around it. Well, Chase, I, I want to cover one more story before we have to call it a night. Uh, I think this sure. is something that affects both of us. This is uh, definitely a concern for uh, for those who are creating their own content. And it's a story that was released a month ago talking about how for the first time 
cable companies have seen more broadband subscriptions than they have had seen TV subscriptions. Now, of, of course, the, the immediate uh, uh, takeaway is going to be, oh, well, th these are all cord cutters. Not necessarily. What they found was that there were 49,915,000 broadband customers and 49,910 of 49 million 910,000 TV subscribers. So it was actually really, really close. This is according to a report by the Lightman Research Group. Uh, most of those broadband subscribers are also TC TV subscribers, and it doesn't necessarily validate that cable cutter phenomenon that I talked about, but I think it does really speak to the changing face of content. I, I would argue that a lot of those customers who have TV along with their broadband, broadband just have it because the pricing is such that it's basically free or cheaper if you get TV along with broadband. Yep. Yep. No, I, it was a long time where I would have the basic, the like limited basic cable package. And uh, it's like $10 cheaper as a loan. Or if you get it internet standalone, you pay $10 more is some sort of weird formula. So they, they made sure that you would still have TV and then they would always contact you like every few months saying, hey, you know, we have this, you know, free digital tier we like to give you and give you a box and all that. Uh, I remember a long time ago, these cable companies, you know, they say they didn't want to be a dumb pipe. You know, they didn't want to be just an internet provider. And I think obviously when you see companies like Comcast, which I don't think they, I know they they had that cap trial and I know right now they're not really enforcing that 250 gig cap. But it's one of those things where it's it's very, very dangerous when you have a company like Comcast, for example, and I don't mean to pick on them, but obviously they're their largest there, that they also produce, you know, they they own television channels, you know, they they own content. And then they have an internet division where, you know, they give you, you know, they give you a, a dumb pipe, if you will, so you can access whatever you want. And then people are like, well, you know, I got my Netflix, I got my Amazon, you know, instant video. Why, why do I need a TV? I mean, I dropped TV two years ago. I haven't missed it since. I get everything I need from Amazon or, uh, you know, YouTube or Netflix, and I'm happy. Now, I'm very lucky. I have fiber where I live. So they realize that that's a, you know, dumb pipe, if you will, because that's, you know, fiber is right. just plain internet. But, you know, gosh, it's one of those things that's going to be very interesting to watch, especially with the new FCC uh, rules on, you know, net neutrality and, you know, the big comment period. It's going to be very interesting to see if, you know, those fast lanes that are passing and end up happening and then seeing how these big companies like Comcast make that transition and how they enforce it. And, and don't forget, they're also trying to get a merger passed as well. So, right. I, I remember um, I'm always, for some reason, when I'm in my Jesuit communities, I'm always the guy who has to deal with technology. That means I'm the guy who has to deal with the broadband subscription uh, and in D.C. and in Hawaii and in San Jose and here in San Francisco, I've had to renegotiate packages because they always do that bundling thing for a year yep. where, mm -hmm. well, yeah, your broadband, uh, what you want is going to cost $80 a month. But if you take it along with telephone and cable, it's going to cost you $50 a month. And it's like, wait a minute. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. So, uh, and so, of course, I'm going to do that. But I think what they're counting on is that after the year is over, I'm just going to let let it keep happening. And in fact, I think in most cases, that's what does happen. I think a lot of these subscriptions just keep going because people forget that after a year, the price is going to go up. Well, they also realize, and they're, they're, they're smart. They also know that they're probably the only option or one of the few options in your area. Either yeah. you may have pretty decent speeds through Comcast, and then you have a DSL provider that unfortunately hasn't updated their infrastructure in years. And so you're pretty much stuck with going with one guy and there's no competition. I'm very, very lucky where I live because we have fiber. Comcast is also a provider here as well. Uh, you could also do a third thing, which is satellite. I know obviously that's not usually practical for broadcasting and video and that sort of thing. But they, they know this. They know that, you know, Padre, that you don't have any competition where you live. So, yeah, they're going to charge you whatever they 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 want and they also know that you know hell you can't leave <laughs> where are you gonna no go oh go, right gonna go to dsl <laughs> <laughs> well no actually we talked about this last week uh, this was that was the most outrageous thing about this whole time warner comcast deal was that the comcast vice president the guy who's in charge of the merger actually made the argument that it was okay for the two companies to merge because they don't actually compete there are no markets at which you can get both <laughs> time warner and comcast and even though they didn't agree to that, 
you look at that and go, that's a monopoly. If, yeah. if, if, if for any reason you guys decided we're not going to compete, we're going to divide up the country, you take this part, we take this part, that's a monopoly. That's anti-competitive behavior. And to hear the VP say it, you know, for everyone, it publicly, to say, yeah, this is the reason why you should approve it. It's like, wait a minute. No, that's the reason why we should break you up. <laughs> yeah. Like, try again. Yeah, and, and 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 it's very interesting to to follow like what the FCC is doing. Uh, you know, the FCC chair, what Tom Wheeler is that his name? I think uh, hopefully it's his name. <laughs> hopefully, I'm not quoting somebody else. But basically, you know, talking about like some municipalities who want to build their own networks because companies like Comcast or Verizon or Frontier or CenturyLink have neglected their communities and updating them to the 21st century of speeds of uh, availability. And then you have companies like Comcast going, you know what? No, no, no. Uh, we're going to throw money at lobbyists and we're going to prevent you local governments from, you know, raising money and doing your own thing. Uh, I mean, take, for example, in my state, in Washington state here, a small little community of Wenatchee, I believe there are about 100,000 people. They took it upon themselves years ago through the public utility district to install their own fiber system because they knew charter uh, wouldn't even think about updating internet speeds. At the time, they had 1.5 megabits down. Now they're being very competitive because there's a viable candidate in the market. And I think when you see companies like Google and other, you know, like SonicNet, I know down there in California, when you see those companies get involved in, in broadband and they purely want to be a broadband broadband provider, sorry, a little tongue twisted there, uh, then you see com competition from companies like Comcast. And I think that's where we need to try to focus our energies and try to create more competition and split up those big monopolies, like you mentioned. I think um, we have to get off this topic because I'm, I'm getting ranty. I mean, anytime nah, we, I enough. cannot <laughs> talk about Comcast or Time Warner or the ISPs without just getting ticked. But we care. I mean, we, we that's the thing. We, we care about what we're doing. We know the yeah. Internet's so important to what we're doing. So how can we not talk about it sometimes? Yeah. So. Well, well, like you, I mean, I... We have a TV in the house. It actually does have dish, which, by the way, is a whole other thing. I, I, okay. I love the fact that it can take me up to two minutes to change the channel. That's awesome. That's great technology. But, no, beyond that, I'm never in there. Some of the people have shows that they keep up with each week, and so they, they want it. But I get all my entertainment over the, over the, the, the broadband lines that come into the school. That's it. That's, that's my okay. TV. Uh, and I'm not a cord cutter. That's just I think that's the new generation. Uh, kids don't watch cartoons anymore. They're going to watch whatever's on YouTube. They're going to watch the latest ed edition of Bravest Warriors, or they're going to watch someone's mi uh, uh, Minecraft videos. Uh, yep. That's that's entertainment. And, you know, the, if, unless we get it together, we've got a bunch of broadband providers who are going to figure out that they can capitalize on that just like they did on TV 30 years ago. Well, I, I think the focus is think local. Um, you know, if, if you are, you know, in a one pony town, say Comcast or Charter or Time Warner, wherever you live, you know, that's where you get involved with your local government or state government and say, hey, you know, we need to bring broadband to our town because these companies, they don't care about us. And I think that's the whole leaning towards, you know, making you know, broadband a utility. I mean, I've heard Leo Laporte talk about that years ago. Municipal uh, broadband. Yeah. Yeah. Which, by the way, is illegal in most states. Yep. Yep. And I wonder who made that happen. Just saying. I wonder who. <laughs> oh, no, there were senators. You know, senators, congressmen, right. who yeah, just yeah. Happened, I mean, happened to get huge checks for their election I mean, campaigns. I, I, I have a phrase that I say. I, I do a show with a good friend of mine, Chris Fisher, on Jupiter Broadcast. And we do a show called Unfilter. We talk about politics. And one thing I always say is show me the money. Because once, once you follow the money train and you see where it is and where it's gone then you know that's where it's being influenced. And so these is, you know, they're smart about it. Comcast and these other companies are smart about where their money's going. And so that's where we need, if you take it locally and you can, you can fight that by, you know, doing that locally. So I encourage people to get involved. Yeah. Chase Noons from Geek Gamer TV. I want to thank you again for being on Padres Corner. Uh, you were on the first beta episode. And so it's nice to have you back. I, 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 I remember that. And uh, you know what I do? I like your work. I love what you do. And I love the fact that you, 
you drive it with a passion. So, again, thanks for coming on to Padres Corner. Of course, people can find you on Twitter. So if they if they want to know what you're doing, probably the best way is to go to twitter.com slash noons. That's uh, N-U-N-E-S. And they're going to be able to see what you're doing, like, for example, when you're on Padres Corner or when right. you're just popping up on a random screen on All About Android. Um, That's but right. That's but if, if they wanted to find more of your work, where should they go? Uh, they can head over to geekgamer.tv. That's pretty much the, the main hub for everything that I post. Uh, we've got links there to our YouTube, and uh, we also have our own Twitter, at GeekGamerTV as well. We do shows, obviously, about Minecraft, but we also do shows about gaming and technology, reviews. Uh, we did a big independent push at PAX 14 this year, which was a lot of fun. Uh, but, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm very big involved in the community, and it's one of those things where if you tweet at me and you engage me in the conversation, I will engage back. So, absolutely, that's where you can find me. Fantastic. Again, it's always a pleasure to have you on the show and uh, to, to get your insight uh, we got to hang someday. But next time you come to the Bay Area, you got to stay at my house. Oh, well, I appreciate that, man. Absolutely. You know, I haven't made my pilgrimage yet to the to the brick house. I, I visited the cottage, uh, but uh, definitely I will be sure to let you know when I'm in the area. Well, you're probably going to have to come here because you're going to watch some of the Giants World Series games, right? Well, of course. I mean, you know, well, that divisional uh, championship series between the Giants and Dodgers, that's going to happen. I, I have to be there for that. I, I mean, know, if, I don't know if we're going to make That's it. why I have go Giants back there, which last time I checked, they weren't doing so well tonight. I'm a diehard fan, but uh, our offense has kind of taken an early vacation, so I don't know what's going on with that. Gotcha. It's a sports ball <laughs> thing. It's a sports ball. Uh, again, sports. that's Chase Noons, Geek Gamer TV at N-U-N-E-S on Twitter. Make sure yep. to check him out. Make sure to follow. Make sure that you uh, you see what he does because he is one of the uh, most fascinating content creators on the Internet today. And uh, we thank you for being part of Padre's Corner. Thanks, Padre. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Now, don't you go away because you're going to find me all over the Twits, all over the Twits TVs on the interwebs. You're going to find me on Mondays at 2.30 for This Week in Enterprise Tech. I sit down with my co-host. We talk all about uh, data centers and switches and routers and things that blink and make our data go. If you want to know how the world is connected, you got to stop by for this week in Enterprise Tech. On Tuesdays, you're going to find me here, right here, 7.30 p.m. Pacific time for Padres Corner, where, again, we get to talk about anything. And if there's something that you want me to talk about on Padres Corner, don't forget that you can always reach out to me on Twitter. That's right. Just go to twitter.com slash PadresJ. You're going to find my feed, see what I'm doing, see uh, what I'm looking at, uh, see when I get ticked off because, for some reason, Bing thinks I'm a Seattle Seahawks fan, which I really like. Thank you, Microsoft. Uh, but you also see links to whatever I've been doing. It's a great place to follow me, and it's a great place to suggest topics for all of my shows. On Thursdays, you're going to find me twice, once at 11 a.m. for Know How with Brian Burnett. I sit and give you some of the knowledge you need to make your own geek projects. If, you've, if you're a maker, if you're a DIYer, if you want to know how to do things like assemble a quadcopter or uh, tune your computer for best performance, why not stop by 11 a.m. Pacific time? And at 1.30, along with Shannon Morse, I do some coding with Coding 101. Of course, that's not the only places you'll find me on Twit TV. Do make sure to follow me on my Twitter account. And if you want to get any episode of Padres Corner, like this one or any of the others, go ahead and drop by twit.tv slash Padre. While you're there, you'll see a little drop-down menu that allows you to get an automatic RSS feed for the audio version or the, the different video versions. Do you want the audio version on your iPhone so you can listen on your way to work? You can do that. Do you want a, a, a low-quality video version on your tablet so you can listen during break? You can do that. Do you want high-quality video automatically downloaded to your Mac or your PC so you can watch it in all its high-definition glory at home? You can do that. Just make sure to drop by twit.tv slash Padre. I want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, Lisa and Leo, who uh, let me turn the lights on, to uh, all the engineers who keep the brick house running. And until next time, I'm Father Robert Ballasare. And you've survived. Audrey's point.